Hi, welcome back to Mind Control. Everything you're going through is preparing you for what you ask God for. The bigger the stuff you ask God for, the greater the requirements. Now, if you don't want nothing to happen to you, quit asking for stuff. You can simplify your life right now. Quit wanting something. But I got to tell you something. That's a hard life. Man. You know, the Bible says to whom much is given, much is required. But when you ain't got nothing, you know, where, where my rent coming from? That, that's, that's every month you got to figure that out? How we gonna eat? We figuring out how we gonna make these ends meet every month. That's hard. So I've been at every economic level there is. I've been stark raving poor, and I've been well off. It's way better to have money. Don't let nobody fool you. I don't know what somebody told you about money, but I've had none for an extended period of time. I mean none. Now you got some problems with money that you can't imagine. When you get it, you gonna have. It ain't a week go by, I don't get two to three pieces of bad news. But you know what I do? I take all that bad news with the knowledge that God must have something else for me. I live my life in expectation. Therefore, guess what? He gives me what I expect. I expect the life of abundance. You think they take this show from under me? You think, you think I'm finna crumble? Don't even worry about Steve Harvey. Don't you know he got something else for me? Something way bigger, something way better? Them people make decisions, they think they crumbling me all the time. They have been making decisions about me for years out here. They can't do nothing with me. I keep showing up over and over and over and over. I'm from Welch, West Virginia. I grew up in the hood. I've been shot. I've been laying on the street that's named Steve Harvey Boulevard. And on the street they said I was dying on. They thought I wasn't gonna get up out that street. That same block I was dying on is named after me now. You can't tell me nothing about what God can't do. God do the impossible, man. See, I expect great things to happen to me, even in the midst of trouble. I dare you to start writing everything down you want. I dare you. I dare you. I dare you to call. You, look man, if you call out God on his word, you better be ready. Cause you about to get checked. If you call him out on his promise, he gonna check you. I've been checked over and over and over till I got it. I don't even fool around no more. I go to God, I ask him for it. Then I write it down. Maybe you just want $100,000 a year. Put it down. Maybe you're just trying to do something nice for your kids or your grandkids. Write it down. How much you want to make a year? How much would you like to see in a savings account? Write this stuff down. This is critical information. It's not a magic trick, man. Quit tripping. This is real. This is how it works. Rich people do this all the time. We ain't out here just making paper because we that good at it and God love us more than he love you. That ain't why we getting it. We getting it because we understand the principles of success and we apply them to our life. Don't let these rich people out here fool you. All these people out here got vision boards. They might not tell you about God, but that's their problem. I don't do nothing without mentioning him because I would be nothing without him. I'm awash without the Lord. Do you hear me? I'm nothing without him. I'd still be living in the car if it wasn't for him. But he came and he got me because I kept asking him over and over and over and over. I dare you to go home and call him on his way. Uh, this is a very important question but to ask you. If you started right now at zero, yeah. no assets, no connections, what are the three things you would do to build your business career? Man, I would tap in. I would tap into, uh, you know, all the things that I know. I mean, if you took everything away from me right now, the, the things that are most valuable to me, you can't take away. So you take the plane away, you take the money away, take the real estate, port, uh, the, the portfolio away. You know, three years from now, I'll be bigger than I was because now I have courage. You guys can just find your courage, man. 
And that, that's a muscle. You gotta go build the muscle of courage. I have courage, nobody can take that away from me. You can't steal it from me, you can't beat it out of me. Um, I have belief now. I know, I know what I can do now. Once you know what you can do, then you can do it a second time. And, and that's why so many people can go bankrupt and then come, come right back. Because they know now. The first time you do it, you don't know. The second time you do it, you're like, I think maybe the third and fourth time, you're like, I know for sure I can do this. So that's why I say success is so important. Success is my duty, responsibility, and obligation to myself. Forget my family for a second. I need success for me, to feel good about me so I can be good with my family. And um, I think a lot of people are trying to do their life without having success be part of it. Success is part of my mental, like, I think, I think success actually is the best medication for my mental health. Because when I'm successful, dude, I'm happy. I'm a good father, I'm a good dad, you know, a good husband. Um, so, yeah, just, you know, it's vital that people are successful. That's what I would tell people, man. You need to make it a priority. You need to make it as important as everything else that's important to you in your life. Here's the deal. Someone's gonna get the candy in life. There's always candy in life. That pinata eventually always breaks down. Do you want to be the person who was there in the beginning hitting as hard as you could and sacrificing and maybe hurting the people around you and never get the candy? Or are you going to get something for your pain? You know what always happens with a pinata? Eventually someone hits it and bam, the candy comes out everywhere. Every blow is like a compound pounding effect. That pounding compounded by multiple people eventually can create a breakthrough. Welcome back to Max Out, everybody. I'm fired up about today's topic because we're gonna talk about one of the things that I think is the most important things as it relates to winning. And it's one of the things that you can decide you're going to do without any natural giftedness because it's the number one talent you must develop in order to win. And it's not talked about on social media. You're not gonna get it in a personal development tape and a peak performance program, self-help and any of it. Remember this, the best ability is availability. Did you hear that? The best ability is availability, that you are available to win. Not enough people understand that this is an actual skill and talent. Most people in business or in life, whether it be relationships or the financial part of their life, they're always looking for these little tips and skills that you should develop. How to communicate better, how to be a better listener, how to suppress your ego, how to influence people, how to transfer energy, all these things that I teach, how to deal with failure. But I believe the greatest talent that you can draw a line through all the people who have won, not all the people that win in business or life are unbelievable transfers of energy. Not all of them can close, not all of them can persuade, not all of them are great listeners, not all of them even dealt well with adversity. They did that the majority of the time. But all of them have in common, they develop the talent, and yes, it is a talent, it is a skill, of not quitting. I don't think most of you right now that are struggling in your business life right now are giving yourself enough credit for this incredible talent you're developing, which is resiliency, which is the ability not to quit. Listen to what I'm telling you, if somebody has built multiple different companies, I've coached some of the top athletes, entertainers, business people, and politicians in the world. And I'm telling you that even in my own team when I hire people, I look for resiliency and a notch above that is the talent, is the skill of not quitting as the number one thing that I look for. And many of you right now listening to this possess the number one skill necessary to win and don't give yourself any credit for it, which means it's not helping build your confidence. It's not going to the bank of crediting for your identity. And so although you possess this incredible ability that so many people in the world don't have and don't possess, you have it and you don't value it. You don't prize it. You don't give yourself credit for having it. It ought to be where you draw the majority of your confidence from. The ability to say, I don't quit, I'm resilient. I own the number one skill, the number one talent required to eventually win, I already have. I can't quit. You'd have to kill me to get me out of chasing my dream, right? So number one, I want to point it out as the number one gift. The best ability is availability. Do you have it? Have you decided to have it? Is it something you're going to possess the rest of your life? And those of you that do have it already, I need you to take an inventory, be aware of it, and be intentional with crediting yourself as you're listening to this or watching it today into the bank of your self-confidence, into the bank, into the deposits you make in your identity because it has everything to do with winning. Every guest you've seen on my show, all the people that I've coached, all have different talents, skills, and abilities. What's the one they all have? 
the ability to stay present, the ability to stay in the fight, to have not quit. You think, well, that's not a big deal. Really? Because as I've been talking, millions of people made the decision to quit on their dream, just as I've been talking to you. The rest of the day, millions more will. Tomorrow, millions more. Every day, literally millions of people quit on one of their dreams, their dream relationship, their dream business, their dream body. So quitting has become the number one habit in the world by people that end up losing. And I'm telling you, it happens every day, every second, everywhere. Just the fact that while I've been speaking, you're still after your dream, you're ahead of them. You don't give yourself enough credit because eventually what I found, it looks like winning's this huge competition. But every day, every week, every year, every decade as time goes by, you're gonna find that you're competing with a smaller and smaller and smaller group of people for your dream because so many of them will just quit. And by the way, many of them that quit will possess talents, maybe even gifts you don't have. Their incredible ability with people, their incredible strength, their incredible brain, and they'll quit with all this giftedness, but you've got the talent. You have to learn to distinguish between something that is a talent and a gift. You can develop skills, you can develop talents. Gifts are something you're born with, but the people that I see that win long-term are the ones who develop the talents and skills required to win. Business and life's a lot like a pinata. You know, I was at a barbecue, a birthday party for a five-year-old a while back, and they did a pinata. I mean, you've seen the pinata before. And it's an unbelievable metaphor for life. In fact, out of the, we had a call today that the life is like a pinata, because it really is. If you look at these kids at these parties, any of you that ever been to a pinata, you can picture it. They got the pinata up there, and what do they do? It's just like in business and life, when you start something new, a new relationship, a new body, a new pursuit, a new business, right? What do they do? They take this little five-year-old and they blindfold him. They blindfold this little guy, right? And he can't see. He doesn't know where he's going. And then they spin him around. He gets completely disoriented, right? And then they hand him a bat. It's scary when you watch it, don't you? Picture these little kids, right? You blindfold them. They spin him around, they become disoriented. Does that sound familiar to any of you that are trying to build a business right now? You're completely disoriented, you're blind, you don't know where to go. They spin this little guy around, they hand him a bat, and they go, hit the pinata. And the pinata's over to the right, and they're swinging to the left. They're just whiffing, right? They're not even in the right direction. And then finally, what do you do? You grab the little guy or the little girl, and you turn them, and you have them face the pinata. They were completely disoriented. In fact, they were doing more damage to the people around them in the beginning with that darn bat you gave them, because they're so disoriented. A lot of damage was done before they even faced the actual pinata. They've been blindfolded and spun around, right? They're completely disoriented. Doesn't that sound familiar? It's just like building your new business. It's just like trying to transform your body. It might be just like this brand new relationship you've got. And in fact, the people around them are in danger in the beginning when you give these little guys this bat. Maybe that sounds familiar. Maybe right now you're at this stage in your business or you've been there before where there's been more damage done than there's been progress. You know what I'm talking about? The people around you have been more hurt by your new venture than benefited from it. Your relationship with them is not as good. Maybe financially you've hurt them or feel like you have. There's been a lot of damage. But what do we do with these little guys? We eventually take the little girl, or the little boy, and we point them in the right direction at the pinata. That's when you find Ed Milet's podcast. You find his teachings. You find his YouTube channel or someone like me, and I can point you in the right direction. And then what do these guys do? They take the bat, and they're hitting the pinata as hard as they can, and they're hitting it, and they're hitting it, and they're hitting it, and no candy comes out. And they get tired, don't they? And they just they can't go anymore. So what do you do? You get help, and you add a teammate, you add a friend, you take the blindfold off of you, and you get a little help. That help could be a new recruit in your business, a new employee, a new vendor. It might be a new mentor. And we put the blindfold on them, we spin them around, and then they're disoriented, they're swinging, and they're not even hitting the pinata yet, they're, they're hurting the people around them. Then what do we do? We take them, we point them in the right direction, now they're following my show, or great teachings. And they hit the pinata as hard as they can. No candy comes out. You take another child, new teammate, new recruit in life, right? But in the pinata says another child, you put a blindfold, spin them around, and they hit the pinata, and they're hitting it as hard as they can, and it feels like no progress is being made. No candy's coming out, right? And then eventually they're hitting it and hitting it, and they get tired. And you think, man, how often do they hit this pinata? And what happens is sometimes the first few kids who hit the pinata, they kind of disappear from the party and start playing somewhere else. Maybe you've had that experience in your business. Some of the people you start with, they may not finish before the candy comes out. They may not be there, may not be there to celebrate, right? Some of the initial people disappear and that could cause you to want to quit. But eventually what happens with that pinata, even though these kids are hitting the pinata and they're teaming up, they're all working together to try to make this candy come out, 
It doesn't look like it, but each shot on that pinata is putting them closer to the candy. Even though it doesn't seem like it, even though you can't see the candy, every blow is like a compound pounding effect. That pounding, compounded by multiple people, eventually can create a breakthrough. But what most people do is they leave the party before the candy comes out. That's true in business. Most people quit before the candy comes out. They don't stick around long enough. They, they got spun around. They get doors disoriented. They might hurt the people around. They get pointed in the right direction. They think they're making progress, then they don't. They think they're making progress, then they don't. And eventually, because no candy's coming out, no money, no changed body, no amazing relationship, they stop swinging the bat at the pinata. But if you stick around for the party long enough, you know what always happens with a pinata? Eventually, someone hits it, and bam, the candy comes out everywhere, and everyone celebrates and gets all the candy and dives on it and celebrates. Here's what I'm here to remind you of today. You gotta stick around long enough for the candy to come out. You gotta wait for the candy to come out of that pinata called your life, called your business, called your body, called your relationships. The vast majority of people in life don't stick around for the candy because they think as they're hitting the pinata of their life, they don't think they're making progress. It doesn't feel like progress. But I'm telling you, the number one ability is availability. And if you keep swinging away every day, even though it doesn't feel like it, you are getting closer to the candy. You're getting closer, it just doesn't feel like it. You know what I had? I had the ability to keep hitting the pinata in my life, to stick around long enough. And by the way, when you eventually win, it's not just you that gets all the candy, that gets all the victory, that gets all the money. Lots of people around you, many of which who you were hurting originally with that bat, many of them who were trying to talk you out of it, they get to celebrate in the candy too. My prayer for you is that you begin to think about this analogy, the pinata of your life, the pinata of your business, the pinata of your body. As you're swinging away, <clears throat> I'm here to tell you, even though it doesn't feel like it, you're getting closer to the candy. And if you can add more people to celebrate, it's okay that you feel disoriented. It's okay that it feels blinding and you don't know exactly what direction to go, just like these precious babies with the pinata. It's okay that you miss it once in a while. It's okay that you get tired once in a while. But as long as you keep after it and you keep pounding away that compound effort of your pounding, I can promise you there's candy someday. And everybody around you will jump on it and celebrate. That's my wish for you today as you listen to me, of all the skills I'm gonna teach you, that I've taught you, and if you've not listened to my other shows, I teach about listening, transfer energy, how to close, how to change your identity, how to live blissfully dissatisfied, how to unlock your success code, all of the very detailed things I teach. Today is the most important thing, is that as you learn all these skills, it'll help you with the blindness. Every single skill you learn, you'll see clearer and clearer and clearer. But if you don't develop the talent, the number one skill in the world, which is to keep hitting the pinata and to stick around until the candy comes out. Because here's the deal. Someone's going to get the candy in life. There's always candy in life. That pinata eventually always breaks down. Do you want to be the person who was there in the beginning hitting as hard as you could and sacrifice it and maybe hurting the people around you and never get the candy? Or are you going to get something for your pain? Are you going to get something for your effort? Are you going to get something for this sacrifice you're making? You've got to get something for this pain. You've got to stick in the game until the candy comes out, and then we all get to celebrate. That's what I want you focused on today. I promise you there's a pinata in your life, and right now many of you feel blind and disoriented, maybe even hurting the people around you. Some of you are past that phase, and you're hitting your thing hard every day, but there's no candy yet. I promise you there's going to be a payoff for you, and that's my message for you today. I hope today helped you. I hope it gave you perspective. I hope it gave you hope. I hope you give yourself credit if you're not a quitter. Credit for you already possessing the number one skill for you to get the candy. Isn't all these other things I teach you, not all the other things you're going to hear on social media, not all the other things you're going to hear on a podcast, although you need those things, the number one thing is you got to be there to collect the candy. You got to not quit. You got to possess that ability. So hopefully that helped you today. And if this video or this audio did help you, I want to challenge you to listen to another one I've got called How to Turn Your Distraction into Success. The reason I recommend this one next is because one of the things that will get you to miss that pinata and not take shots at your dream, that thing you're breaking down to get to your candy, to get to your dream, is distraction. And in that audio and video, I teach you the steps to eliminate distractions so that you're getting more shots on the pinata 
and less whiffs every single day in your life. So I recommend you go to that audio or that video next. God bless you and Max out. Hey guys, thanks for sticking around. If you'd like more, click the videos right here. They're exactly what you need to see next. And if you're new here, hit subscribe and become a part of the Max Out community. And tell me what you think about the videos in the comments below. I read all of them every week, and I select winners that get all kinds of prizes, gear, coaching calls with me. Make a comment. When you get in certain states, you think one thought. When you get in other states, you think another thought. It's like turning the channel. And so what I really show people in the book how to do is how to turn the channel so that you're not suffering and you're living in a beautiful state. But what does it take? Let's just quickly say it. Number one, it takes acknowledging what's your favorite flavor of suffering. Is it worry? Is it stress? Is it anger? Is it loneliness? Is it boredom? Is it overwhelm? And then noticing what are the thoughts that trigger that and realizing it doesn't matter how much money you have, those thoughts can still make a billionaire crazy and frustrated and overwhelmed. And so what I show people to do is a process of how to let go of those thoughts. And we walk through that in the book in detail, but fundamentally it starts with making the most important decision of your life, which is, if I would ask me up until two years ago, I wouldn't say it's who you spend time with, who you love, because who you spend time with is who you become. I think, it's a, I think it's still one of the most important decisions in life. But you can pick the right person and still do things in your head and make yourself miserable. So you really have to decide. The most important decision is, do I want to be happy? Will I commit to being happy? More important than happy. Sometimes you'll be so happy you smile so much your face hurts, right? You need variety. Am I committed to living in a beautiful state even when it doesn't go my way? Even when it rains on my parade? Even when my biggest fear shows up? Because I can't control whether your husband or wife will live or die or get sick or leave you or get divorced. I don't want any of that to happen to any human being. I hate suffering. I do anything I can to help people not suffer. But I can't control that. You can. You can. There are people who've lost their arms, lost their sight. There have been people that have been through the most horrific experiences in life and they found a way to still be happy because they've made the decision that life is too short to suffer. I've interviewed dozens and hundreds over the years, but dozens that like have impacted my soul, that made me realize I can change this. I've just gotten used to it. I've bought into the theory that this, this survival software that's constantly running and making you suffer, that that's normal. No, that's what the mind will do. And mind has been around forever. What I'm gonna do is something different. And the way I get out of suffering, I give myself a 90 second rule. It's really simple. I say, look, if I feel myself starting to feel that stress, feeling that pissed offness or upsetness or concern or worry about my kid, whatever, I realize that's not gonna make it better. Life's too short to suffer. And then I just kind of breathe slowly, slow everything down, and I just watch the thought go by. Go, look at that crazy thought. Because everybody's had crazy thoughts. Everybody's had a thought, I'm gonna kill that son of a bitch, right? And then you don't kill him because you don't believe that thought. It's the thoughts that are stressful that you believe that mess you up. When you question them, you break the pattern. And then the last thing besides the 90 seconds, and by the way, Richard, be honest, in the beginning, it should have been like a four hour rule. <laughs> Maybe a four day rule. I was not very good. A waiting. Yes. Yeah, so, but what's nice is the more I've done, it's like a muscle. The more I've trained myself to do it, I can authentically tell you now, it takes a lot for something to take more than 90 seconds for me now. And the level of joy surpasses all the money you could ever have in a million years. And then the money, it's easier to make money because you're not attached. You don't have the fears. You don't have the, the scarcity that people have because you feel so rich already right now. I always tell people, don't wait to be rich. What is that richness? It's abundance, it's joy, it's happiness, it's contribution, it's getting out of yourself. Because as long as we're thinking about, oh my God, I lost something, or you did something, now I have less love, less respect, less money. If I think loss less, or because you did something, or because I did something, I'm never gonna have what I want in my life. Loss less never. Those three thought patterns, they're the source of all suffering. And the antidote, see it for what it really is, know it's BS, and find something to appreciate. Thank you so much for watching till the end. Don't forget to share your thoughts in the comments section. Please also like, subscribe, and share this video with your friends and families. Please watch our other motivational videos. Thank you again. Here's the greatest essence of life, and that's living well, weaving a tapestry of life experience. What constitutes a good life? What is a good life? Because that's the highest essence of life is to live a good life. Let me give you a pretty good list. Here's number one, productivity. You won't be happy if you don't produce. 
That's why the 6-1 was arranged, so that you spend the greater part of your life and your time producing, producing, producing a working day, produce an idea and make it fly, produce an enterprise and make it grow, produce a relationship and give it life, to produce, to produce, to create progress. You won't be happy if you don't produce. Work to do that. There's an ancient script that says, the sleep of a laboring man is sweet. Someone who labors to produce with their hands, who works hard, that sleep is sweet. Not the sleep of a goof-off man, not the sleep of a drifting man, the sleep of a laboring man. Somebody who works, puts in the time and the effort and the work and the labor, whether you labor with your hands or labor with your voice, whatever you do, physical, spiritual, personal, that labor produces good sleep. So we must produce. But here's the rest of a good life. Next is friendship. The greatest support system in the world probably is friendship. And you've got to nourish your friendships. Don't lose contact. Keep in touch. We all have to work on that. Letting too much time go by between visits and conversation and telephone and letters, personal contact, so that you keep alive this reservoir of goodwill in terms of friendship that can give you support when you really need it. Develop the support system. Good friends. Those people who know all about you and still like you, right? Good friends. Next is your culture. America understands this probably better than any other country. The dynamics of culture, especially the dynamics of multiculture. A single culture is dynamic, but when you put together multicultures like America, it can produce the most stunning results. It can produce the most incredible wealth, such as never been known to the world in 6,000 years. The wealth that has been created by multicultures working together, contributing to each other. What one lacks, the other one's got. What one gots, the other one shares. The state we're in, in the moment, the state we're in at any moment, powerfully impact, impacts the meaning we associate to something. The state we're in, in the moment, powerfully impacts the meaning that we associate to something or that we assign to something. So one way to change what things mean to you is just change your darn state. Is that true? I mean, if you're feeling great, do things just kind of bounce off you that normally, if you're feeling upset, would you change the way you look at them probably, change the way you feel about it? You bet. So we need to really still manage our state. And we talked about that a great deal last session. I want to make sure that that's part of your life's work. Because your life's work is really learning how to live in a way where you spend most of your time enjoying yourself, very little time in pain. Most of your time in pleasure, very little pain. And living your life hopefully in a way where not only do you feel good all the time, but the people around you feel good just by being around you. That because they're around you, they feel a lot less pain and a ton of pleasure. See, that's my idea of success. Success is when you've learned to live your life in a way where you experience tons of pleasure every day and almost no pain. And simultaneously, where the way you live also causes the people around you to experience very little pain and tons of pleasure. Then you know you're really successful. Because if you feel good and nobody else does, you're a failure. Now, that doesn't mean you go around and try and make everybody feel good. Some people have an investment in feeling bad because they think feeling bad equals feeling good. Are there people to believe that, yes or no? Yeah, because they think if I feel bad, then people will notice me or they'll love me more, they'll help me more, I'll get more attention, which means feeling good. People have weird crap they work up inside their head about how to get to feeling good. Some people think I'm gonna feel good when I make a billion dollars. Some people are like, when I have this, this, and this, when I get married, have these many children, this and this, then I'll feel good. Some people have, well, I'll feel good if I feel bad because then people notice me and make me feel good. Or you could just like choose to feel good. Which one do you think might be a more intelligent approach? Because who's in control there? You are, you don't have to worry about the environment. By the way, when you're feeling good, it tends to make you want to feel even better. It makes you share good feelings with other people, which makes them feel good, which makes them reciprocate usually. Not always, but usually, kind of nice. So the bottom line is we've got to manage our state still. And as a reminder, as far as that's concerned, changing state means change the meaning. And the way you can do it is either by changing your what? Anybody remember from last session? Change your what? Change your what? Change your physiology. Physiology, again, means the way you move, the way you breathe, your facial expressions, your gestures. The way you use your body determines the way you feel. You've got to remember that for the rest of your life. If you're not feeling the way you want to feel, first thing you do is just change the way you're moving. Emotion is created by what? Motion. Emotion is created by motion. You have 50 muscles in your face. A slight change in any of these muscles will radically change the way you feel. Remember, we did this last time, I think. What I'd like you to do right now, real quick, is create some tension in your body, some tension, then put a big, huge smile on your face while you're doing it and notice how it feels. I want to talk to you today about you are enough. It's easy to go through life thinking that we're lacking in some area. If we had more talent, then we could do something great. If we had a better personality, 
we were more confident, more attractive, then we could reach our dreams. But as long as you're discounting yourself, thinking you're at a disadvantage, it will keep you from rising higher. When God laid out the plan for your life, He carefully studied it. He thought about what you would need and what it would take to get you there. Then He matched you with your world. He gave you the talent you need, the strength, the confidence. You are the right size. You have the right looks. You have the right personality. You come from the right family. You are not lacking. You didn't get shortchanged. You are good enough. You are talented enough. You are smart enough. You are attractive enough. You have been fearfully and wonderfully made. But life will try to push us down. Thoughts will whisper everything that we're not. You're not as talented as your friend. You're not as attractive as your coworker. You're not as smart as your cousin. That's okay. You're not running their race. You don't need what they have. If you needed it, God would have given it to you. If you needed to be taller, you would be taller. If you needed a different personality, you would have one. If you needed to come from another family, that would have happened. God doesn't make mistakes. When he created you, he wasn't having a bad day. He didn't accidentally leave something out. Now you're at a disadvantage. He calls you a masterpiece. You have royal blood flowing through your veins. He's crowned you with his favor. You're not lacking. You didn't get shortchanged. You have everything you need to fulfill your destiny. Now quit comparing your looks, your gifts, your success with somebody else and be you. In fifth dimensional creation, you are not going anywhere to get anything. Fifth dimensional creation has nothing to do with going anywhere to get anything. Because if you combine a clear intention, a coherent thought, coherent brainwave pattern, with a coherent heart, moving into that elevated emotion, thoughts are electric and feelings are magnetic. The magnetism of this center becomes the energy. The intention is carried on that energy. And now you are broadcasting a new signature into the quantum field. Now, if it's done properly and you understand the mechanics, in fifth dimensional creation, you are not going anywhere to get anything. You are actually collapsing space and time and you are drawing the experience to you. You are the vortex because when there's a vibrational match, between your energy and that potential that exists in the quantum field by tuning a radio dial, when you lock into that frequency, if you keep revisiting that energetic signature over again every single day, then you don't have to go anywhere and get it. The new job finds you. The new house actually finds you. The new relationship finds you because you are the vortex that's drawing the experience to you. My definition of creation is when I forget about me. Mm. I become nobody, no one, no thing, nowhere, and no time. I become pure consciousness. And the moment I reach that elegant moment of the generous present moment, all possibilities in the quantum field exist truly when our brain and body are in the present moment. Getting there is the work. So then, most people then create reality from what we call three-dimensional creation. Now, when you teach people how to take their attention off of matter, off of objects, off of the particle, and sense energy and sense space and pay attention to nothing, the moment they begin to open their focus, all of a sudden their brain waves begin to change from beta to alpha, but not only just alpha where the imaginary inner world starts to become more real, but very coherent brainwave patterns in alpha. So when you're under stress, you're trying to control that person, that thing, that experience, and your attention is shifting from one thing to the next. Turns out that each one of those things has a neurological network and the brain assigned to it because we've experienced it. Right. So as you try to control all these things and your attention is shifting, There's you no measure coherency. the brain. The brain is very incoherent. Why is it important to have coherency? Well, because the moment you open your focus and the brain begins to acclimate, Different compartments of the brain begin to unify, they begin to synchronize, and what sinks in the brain links in the brain. Okay. So when your brain is coherent, you're coherent. 
When your brain is incoherent, you are incoherent. A person, the maverick, who's willing to step out into the unknown, that unknown is the perfect place to create from. Because only in the unknown can you create something new. And if you and I can become comfortable in that unknown place, then the best way to predict the future is to create it from that unknown place. Now, when people start crossing the river of change from the old self to the new self, because they're no longer thinking, acting, and feeling in the same way, there is literally a biological, a neurological, a genetic, a chemical death of the old self. And this dark night of the soul, this, this unfamiliar place, is the true uh, value, the true step towards developing a new self. So then if we're leaving the old and we are creating the new, then the next most important question is, well, if I'm going to create a new self, what thoughts do I want to think? What behaviors can I plan? And as you begin to image and rehearse a new way of being, you're changing your brain and body neurologically and biologically. That's the neuroscientific model of mental rehearsal. And as we begin to remind ourselves who we no longer want to be, and we remind ourselves every day of who we do want to be, there'll come a moment where we begin to silence the circuits in our brain that are connected to the old self and inhibit the chemicals that reaffirm the same identity and then begin to fire and wire new circuits in our brain that begins to install the neurological hardware that begins to create a level of inspiration where we start seeing new possibilities we see a new landscape we see a new horizon and that person who crosses the river of change then all of a sudden has new opportunities in their life in this field that i came upon a clue which has enabled me to help millions of people to find their earthly destinies. I want to describe my discovery in the simplest terms possible because it will reveal to you why it is true that whatever the mind can conceive and believe, the mind can achieve, regardless of how many times you may have failed in the past or how lofty your aims and hopes may be. I caught my first fleeting glimpse of the profound law which provides the means by which we may choose our own purpose in life and attain it while I was being coached by Andrew Carnegie during the organization of the science of success philosophy. I had just finished telling Mr. Carnegie that I feared he had uh, chosen the wrong person to give the world the first practical philosophy of personal success because of my youth, my lack of education, and my lack of finances. Well, at this point, Mr. Carnegie delivered a lecture that I shall never forget because it changed my entire life and paved the way for my helping to change the lives of millions of people, some of them not yet born. Let me call your attention to a great power which is under your control, said Mr. Carnegie, a power which is greater than poverty, greater than the lack of education, greater than all of your fears and superstitions combined. It is the power to take possession of your own mind and direct it to whatever ends you may desire. This profound power, Mr. Carnegie continued, is the gift of the Creator, and it must have been considered the greatest of all of his gifts to man, because it is the only thing over which man has the complete and unchallengeable right of control and direction. When you speak of your poverty and lack of education, Mr. Carnegie explained, you are simply directing your mind power to attract these undesirable circumstances because it is true that whatever your mind feeds upon your mind attracts to you now you see why it is important that you recognize that all success begins with definiteness of purpose with a clear picture in your mind of precisely what you want from life uh, then mr carnegie continued his speech with a description of a great universal truth which made such an impact upon my mind that I began then and there to give myself a new outlook on life and I set up for myself a goal so far above my previous achievements that it shocked my friends and relatives when they heard about it. 
Everyone, said Mr. Carnegie, comes to the earth plane blessed with the privilege of controlling his mind power and directing it to whatever ends he may choose. But, he continued, everyone brings over with him at birth the equivalent of two sealed envelopes, one of which is clearly labeled the riches you may enjoy if you take possession of your own mind and direct it to ends of your own choice. And the other is labeled the penalties you must pay if you neglect to take possession of your mind and direct it. And now let me reveal to you, said Mr. Carnegie, the contents of those two sealed envelopes. In the one labeled riches is uh, this list of blessings. One, sound health. Two, peace of mind. Three, a labor of love of your own choice. Four, freedom from fear and worry. Five, a positive mental attitude. Six, material riches of your own choice and quantity. In the sealed envelope labeled penalties, Mr. Carnegie continued, is this list of the prices one must pay for neglecting to take possession of his own mind. One, ill health. Two, fear and worry. Three, indecision and doubt. Four, frustration and discouragement throughout life. Five, poverty and want. Six, and a whole flock of evils consisting of envy, greed, jealousy, anger, hatred, and superstition. Now, my mission in life is to help you and everyone who needs my help to open up and use the contents of the sealed envelope labeled riches. And the starting point from which you must take off if you wish to write your own ticket from here on out for the remainder of your life, I will describe for you in these simple instructions. One, procure a neat pocket-sized notebook or something on the order of this one here, loose leaf affair. And on uh, page one, write down a clear description of your major desire in life the one circumstance or position or thing which you will be willing to accept as your idea of success. And remember before you begin writing that your only limitations are those which you set up in your own mind or permit others to set up for you. And two, on page two of your notebook, write down a clear statement of precisely what you intend to give in return for that which you desire from life and then start in right where you stand now to begin giving. And three, memorize both of your statements, what you desire and what you intend to give in return for it, and repeat them at least a dozen times daily. And always end your statements with this expression of gratitude for the blessings with which you were gifted at birth. I ask not for divine providence or more riches, but more wisdom with which to accept and use wisely the riches I received at birth in the form of the power to control and direct my mind to whatever ends I desire. If you are not too successful or self-satisfied to accept and express this profound prayer, if you accept it and express it in the same spirit of humble sincerity in which I pass it on to you, a new and a better world will reveal itself to you. A world in which you will see reflected the circumstances and the things which you yourself have created. And now let me close this, our first visit, with my favorite expression of gratitude. O divine providence, I ask not for more riches, but more wisdom with which to make wiser use of the riches you gave me at birth, consisting in the power to control and direct my own mind to whatever ends I desire.